Good morning and welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. Uh, the Signpost webinar is brought to you by Chagask in conjunction with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and uh, National Rural Network. Uh, this morning, I'm joined by Porik Foley, who will be taking questions and answer, asking questions. Good morning, Porik. Good morning, Pat. Thanks for having me. And speaking this morning, we're, I'm joined by uh, Seamus Carney. Seamus is Signpost Programs uh, Specialist with Chagask, and uh, Jonathan Hearn. Jonathan is a postdoc researcher at, at, at Moore Park. Uh, Jonathan, if you turn on your uh, speaker there, uh, you might just give us a, an idea of what you do down at Moore Park. Yeah, so the area which I'm working in is called life cycle assessment. So it's just the methodology just there to calculate um, environmental impacts, um, basically from ruminant systems. So predominantly dairy based. So I'm, I'm, I'm um, currently on, on Vista Mill project. So just working on calculating uh, environmental impact of dairy systems uh, and how we can reduce them. And, and morning, doing that with the signpost program. You, you'll be looking at a couple of case studies uh, yeah. of signpost assessments. She Seamus, I think you're up first this morning. Uh, Seamus, you're a specialist with the signpost program. Do you want to introduce the signpost program to us a little bit? Yeah, um, I suppose, look, I've come from a background of 25 years working as a, a dairy advisor with, with uh, dairy clients um, in Cavan and Waterford. Um, so I've taken up the, the role of training development specialist with the signpost program since May this year. Uh, so, so the background to the signpost program is there's over 100 farmers um, in, spread throughout the, the country. All of the different enterprises have been incorporated into the signpost program where the latest technology will be um, implemented on those farms to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the um, inputs and the profitability will be measured in these farms to see what kind of emission reduction that we can achieve on these farms and to use these then as exemplar farms to spread the message to the, the wider community. So it's, it's the kind of lighthouse farms to help all farmers reduce their emissions. Okay, so it's highly highly appropriate in the week of... Uh, yeah, highly appropriate just for the, the week after getting our budgets last week. Okay, well, if you're ready to go ahead uh, with your, your presentation, uh, you, you might share your screen with us. Thanks. Okay, can you see that there, Pat? Yeah, that's fine. So fire ahead and you're ready. Perfect. Thank you very much, Pat. And look, I suppose the, the title of my presentation is looking at I suppose the practical actions that uh, Irish farmers can take on to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on Irish farms. So it's all about taking action to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I suppose the, the, what I'm going to look at this morning is just to, to break down the challenge facing agriculture. Uh, I want to briefly look at the emissions by the type of enterprise at farm level. We're going to put in place the building blocks that each farmer can implement to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions on their farm. We're going to quantify the actions and briefly look at um, what kind of a effect these could have on a suckler and a, and a, and a store to whaling operation. And I suppose the one thing with farmers we're very conscious of, there's a lot of anxiety and worry out there. What does this mean for farmers at ground level? And I suppose put into context, I suppose the, the big figure that has been um, given to agriculture as of last week was we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by between 22 and 30% by 2030. And that's from a basis of the emissions we had uh, as a sector in 2018. And it, it can be very, um, cause anxiety for farmers, but look, we're, this morning we're going to break it down into, bite, into small little bite-sized chunks. And I suppose just a, a picture of an elephant there, like how do you eat an elephant? You do it one, one, one bite at a time. And it's the very same with breaking down what this means to farmers at ground level. So to put into context, the, this screen here is just showing, the red bar is just showing on average for the last two years, for 19 and 20, that agriculture reduced its emissions by 1.3% per annum. Now, to put into context, when we break down the emissions that we have to meet in agriculture for the next five years, uh, at the end of the year, the agricultural sector has to reduce its overall emissions by 2.5% a year, between 2 and 3%, 2.5% per year on average, and 4.5% per year for the following five years after that. Now, we're not going to worry about beyond 25. We'll go as far as half time. We're going to the address room. Uh, we get some water in and we take on the second half then after. So for the first half, we have to achieve a reduction on our greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 2.5% per year for the next five years. And how is this measured? It's measured by the CSO. So what I just put up here is a little snapshot. And basically this figure here on the screen for 2019 is showing that agriculture emissions within Ireland reduced by 4% in 2019. And what was behind that 4% reduction? 
the big one was that fertilizer use in Irish farms reduced by 10%. Now, as part of that, there was also the starting to switch to protect the jury, which had a knock-on effect in a positive way, and also the switch to low emission story spreading from 2018. And these are based from 18 to 19, and 18 is the basis for emissions for agriculture going forward. Now, Lyme did reduce that year by 25%. That would have a knock-on effect of reducing this by about half percent overall, and the dairy cow numbers went up by about 2.8%. Um, now, the sucker cow numbers are down something similar. If we didn't look at 2020, the agricultural emissions went up 1.4%. What was the driver behind that? 3.5% uh, more fertilizer used on farms. Dairy cow numbers went up about 3.2%, but the sucker cow numbers did reduce somewhat similar. Okay? So fertilizer use has big bearing on what happens on emissions on Irish farms. So to, before we look at the actions, maybe just to break down the kind of profile of the emissions at different farms uh, in Ireland. So first of all, we're going to look at a dairy footprint. And what I put up here is uh, what a farmer gets back on his boar beer uh, audit, his feedback report. And if we look at it here, the light blue bars is showing the emissions for the, for the average farm from 75 to 100 cows in Ireland. The other bars here was the individual farmer's previous audit and his current audit. So we're going to focus on the blue bars, the average farmer. And on average, the average dairy farmer in Ireland has 90 milking cows. So the average dairy farmer falls into this category here. 43% of their total emissions come from uh, animal digestion. There is 22% of their emissions coming from the cows manuring at grass, manuring in the sheds, how they store the manure, and also how they spread the manure. So 65% of the emissions come from pretty much related to the animal or manure management. We're looking at 16% from fertilizer, 11% from feed, 7% from energy use. So 35% from uh, inputs, 65% from the cow. Uh, so even by cutting these by, uh, by half, we're still only getting to about 17, 18% of a reduction overall on dairy farms. So if we look at suckler farms, the average suckler farm, again, we look at a suckler to weighing store farm. Again, the blue bear is the average for the enterprise. So 58% of emissions on suckler to weaning store farms are coming from animal digestion at farm level. 31% is coming from the cow uh, producing manure at grass, uh, how the manure is st stored and spread, 4% from fertilizer use, 1% from meal, and 6% from energy use. So almost 90% related to the animal, 11% on inputs. So inputs alone aren't going to, to, to get the reduction on, on dry stock farms, we have to look at uh, the amount of cows per calf per year when the heifers are calving, reducing animals in an earlier age. That's what comes into account on the dry stock farms. So maybe we'll look next at, I suppose, the practical actions that farmers can undertake to reduce their emissions at farm level. So like any good house, you have to put in a solid foundation. So the foundation for reducing greenhouse gas emissions at farm level, first of all, is soil fertility. It's about getting the lime, the pea and the K right. Okay. If the, the lime soil fertility is correct, and only 18% of Irish soils have, are optimum for lime, P, and K, that will reduce naturally occurring nitrogen from the ground. Um, the second thing is we need to look at productive animals. So cows, dairy cows are good, EBI. Um, so getting more production from less cows. Uh, and in relation to, to suckler stock, it's breeding cows that will have a calf per cow per year, a good weight gain, earlier finish, uh, which follows on to the beef farmer then as well. It's having healthy animals that they're performing while they're on the farm. And to be cognizant of all times, we need to, we need to improve water quality and maintain it. So we need to adhere to buffer zones, so no slurry within five metres of any open drain. Um, and we need to have fences back one and a half metres. And we need to be careful with our timing of applications of slurry and fertiliser. And we also have to improve on biodiversity. And from Karen Keane's talk last week is about hydro management, uh, incorporating and maintaining trees and maintaining high value nature on these farms. When the foundation is right, we then start putting in the other next layer of blocks on top of it. And the next layer, layer of blocks is all about the type of fertilizer we use. And we'll come on to that now in a minute, when we put it out and how much we use. It's about having enough slurry storage that we put out the slurry at the right time and we spread it by the right methods. It's about keeping stock as long as possible at grass, grass measuring and giving good quality grass during the summer, during the grazing season. 
And when all these parts are together, then we look at clover and mixed species swords to establish them in existing and in new, new reseeds to try and reduce the amount of nitrogen used at farm level. Um, but be cognizant of all time that when we talk about sustainability, uh, it's social, economic, and uh, social, economic, and um, um, environmental sustainability. So the farmer is the, the person at the center of the whole thing, and farm profitability has to be increasing as we go. So we just look at some of the actions and looking at animal productivity, uh, the economic breeding in index uh, for dairy cows, how does it work? Basically for every 10 euro increase in EBI, it translates to more money in the farmer's pocket, 20 euro more profit per cow per year. But at the same time, by having uh, more efficient cows, we can reduce the greenhouse gas emission, uh, the footprint by 1% for every increase in EBI of 10 euro. And how does that work? It comes true by having more mature herds, higher milk solids per cow, and it also helps by lowering the replacement rates. Does bring the replacement rates back from uh, 25 towards 18 to 20 percent. So it's it's about getting the same output or a little bit more output with less animals. And it's very much the same principle with the maternal replacement index, where it's about improving health and survival. Uh, it's getting a calf per cow per year, uh, earlier um, finished animals shorter calving intervals. So more productive type cows uh, where you're getting the same output with less amount of, of inputs. This, the next bit we move on to is looking at grassland management and how does that affect uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and and from, from work done on research, every extra week of grass can reduce the carbon footprint of product, be that lamb, um, lamb beef or milk by 1%. So every extra week of grass and reduce the carbon footprint by 1%. And likewise with quality grass, um, this would be, would be probably relevant during the summer months. Uh, uh, grazing the appropriate good grazing covers of 13, 1400 covers for the summer versus very strong grass um, and of, of 2000 covers, uh, that can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 15% per day. Now we're, we're talking about a period of maybe six to eight weeks throughout the year uh, where this could actually happen, where the grass get, starts getting very strong or grassland management mightn't be top class. So it could give an overall reduction in footprint over a full year of one to two percent. Now, and I suppose the, the, the knock on on that is if by improving the, 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 the grassland management and the quality of the grass the cows are eating, it will lead on to reducing the amount of meal that needs to be fed per cow and from work that Jonathan and, and Lauren Chaloux have done in Moorpark, uh, reducing meal feeding by between 50 and 100 kilos of meal per cow can reduce the overall footprint by 1% overall. Um, and the other thing we look at is silage quality. Uh, higher DMD silage has lower fiber. So lower DMD silage is higher fiber and higher fiber creates more methane. So by having better quality silage, we can also lower our greenhouse gas emissions. So the next area we move on to is fertilizer and the type of fertilizer has a huge bearing on uh, what we what it does for our overall emissions as as a as an industry so protected urea i suppose the, the protected urea um tis tis um only one quarter of the emissions of can so it's four times more environmentally friendly than can based fertilizers um so it's lower in ammonia and it's also lower in nitrous oxide um, and from some case studies that Jonathan has put through, and you'll see in Jonathan's uh, figures in a minute, the protected urea on a dairy farm, going from 100% can to 100% protected urea, uh, it can reduce the overall emissions on a dairy farm by 78%. Uh, if we do the same principle on a beef farm, we're looking at a 2 to 4% reduction overall. The reason being the fertilizer use on beef farms is substantially lower than dairy farms. And these farms here with 7 to 8% reduction is spreading 200, 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. Um, so I suppose you could say that a protected urea, I suppose, is, is, is the uh, agriculture's answer to electric care. It's a different version of the same product to get you the same end result, but has way lower emissions from a farming point of view. Uh, by reducing the fertilizers and export a call, uh, by reducing fertilizer on dairy farms, we can get a, a reduction of up to 5% in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, on beef farms, the same principle, again, due to less fertilizer being used, the reduction can be one to 2%, okay? So protected urea, so the type of fertilizer has a massive bearing, first of all, 
then it's about trying to reduce the amount of fertilizer overall. And we're very cognizant on that. With the price of fertilizer, what it looks like for next year, uh, farmers will probably have to be more specific with when they put out fertilizer, uh, what they put out and the timing of the, when they put it out. So we come back to soil fertility and look, I suppose the one thing is while availability of fertilizer could be a big issue next year, the starting point is lime. Uh, by getting the lime P and K right, we can release up to 80 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year from naturally occurring mineralization in the soil. That's up to 60 units per, per acre. And to put into context, um, our national herd for 18, 19, 20, 21 is pretty much similar in size wise. Um, and if I go back to 1974, uh, the, the, the national herd today a 7.3 million head of animals. It was 7.2 in 1974. But the big difference in 1974 is we were spreading twice the amount of lime in 1974 than we are today. And we were spreading it at a rate of one load of lime per year for every 60 livestock units. So that's two loads of lime for an average dairy farmer and one load of lime for an average dry stock farmer every year to help cut down our fertilizer. We didn't move on to clover. Clover and mixed species swords can they can uh, put in up to 100 kilos of nitrogen per year uh, to replace synthetic or chemical fertilizer. When we move on to slurry, the timing of slurry, spreading slurry with a splash plate in the summer will give you about three units per thousand gallons of uh, nitrogen. If we move that to the springtime, we go from three to six units per thousand gallons. And if we didn't move again to low emission slurry spreading or environmentally friendly slurry spreading, we can add another three units again. So a splash plate in the summer will give you three units per thousand gallons. A low emission slurry spreader in the springtime before the first of May can give you up to nine units per thousand gallons, which will help reduce our fertilizer and our footprint. So briefly looking at it in, what kind of effect could this have on a dairy farm? So if we just take a dairy farm uh, up to 2030, uh, the dairy farms from the Board Bay of Footprints are stocked at just under two cows per hectare. So if we can increase next week of grass, we can get a 1% reduction in our footprint. Better quality grass in the summer could give another 1%. Cutting the meal, 1%. Now there is a crossover effect on some of these ones here. By increasing the EBI by 10 euro per year for the next uh, nine years, that has a knock-on effect possibly of up to 9% reduction on the greenhouse gas emissions. By cutting the nitrogen by 25% can give us another 5% reduction. Protected urea is one of the big wins very quickly, 7%. Uh, low emission slurry spreading, 2%. And by reducing the energy usage on the farm, we're talking about like the solar in that case, could give us another 1% as well. So there is some crossover effect on these. And in some cases, it might be making a few less cows or better production potential. Uh, there's a possibility of 23 to 27% there on some dairy farms. And coming back here to the sustainability leaf developed by some of our colleagues in Chagas, uh, I suppose the principle is it's about improving the breeding of the animals, extending the grazing season, trying to reduce fertilizer through substituting clover, um, mixed species swords, lime, changing protected urea, low emission slurry spreading, reducing energy use. And after that, then we look at trying to sequester more with likes of maybe incorporating some trees or improving hedgerow management on farms. And then it's about trying to improve our water quality through the ASAP service. If we do the same um, exercise for a um, sucker to waning uh, farm, um, we're looking at the average stocking rate from the boar beer carbon footprints is about 1.4 lysogonus per hectare. So if we could get an extra two weeks of grass, it could reduce the overall emissions by 2%. Uh, better quality grass for the summer, another 1%. Uh, one of the big ones for the calving systems is by reducing the calving interval, but, and, and the average farm in this scenario here is about 46 lysogonus units with about 25 cows. By reducing the calving interval from 391 days back to 375 days can give a reduction of two to 3% in emissions. But one of the other big ones is moving the heifers calving from two and a half years back to two years can give another four or 5% reduction on emissions. Because at the minute only 23% of all heifers calving on dry stock farms are calving within the two year of age mark. Reducing fertilizer by 25% can give a 1% reduction. Protected urea one to 2% because of less fertilizer. Low emissions slurry spreading another one to 2% and reducing energy of 1%. Uh, so possible reduction there of 13 to 16%, but again, the ones to go after have the biggest effect on our national inventory, the quickest is less fertilizer, protected urea, and low emission slurry spreading. So to summarize what I've gone through there is, 
I suppose the good thing is, in order to lower greenhouse gas emissions, it is compatible with good farming and profit for farmers. And the core principle is all about getting the basics right. So it's about starting with our soil fertility, lime, P and K. It's about breeding good, healthy animals. So it's about um, better rather than more. It's about improving our grassland management and trying to reduce our fertilizer use. And I suppose to, to, to look at where can we go after the quick wins to help the overall emissions figure for agriculture for the next um, five years. Uh, and that's the, the first half of the match. And that's about looking at protected urea. That's the, the simplest switch is change the fertilizer type. Then it's about how you spread your slurry, spreading it in the spring and with a low emission slurry spreading, it's efficient use of fertilizer and grassland management. And I would also say that while we're, 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 we don't have to cut our national numbers uh, from a national point of view, on every farm, there's marginal cows. On dairy farms, there's probably 5% of the lower cows in the farm. Wouldn't really be missed from a production point of view. It would take a lot of pressure off the system. And when we talk about suckler farms, there's 17 out of 100 cows on every suckler farm, on average throughout the country, they don't have a calf every year. So it's, it's tidying up the, the loose ends on somebody's farm. So maybe to finish up with a little shopping list for what you can do for, 2000, for 2022, whether you're a farmer or an advisor working in the industry, I suppose the big areas we have to go after is lime. Um, and as I said earlier on there, lime is like geothermal for, for agriculture. It can release naturally occurring nitrogen out of the ground. It's about using low emission slurry spreading and getting the slurry out in uh, February, March time to get more use of our slurry next spring. It's about changing the protected urea. And by doing these, we can get a bit of reduction on the fertilizer. I think the price is going to drive some of that as well next year. And it's also about looking at the marginal cow or the surplus stock on farms where they could be putting pressure on stocking rate by taking them out of the equation. They could help profitability, help produce your fertilizer and get longer grazing season at Graston as well. So that's where I finish up, Pat. So I'll hand back to you. And I think Jonathan is going to go through specific case studies then after that. Okay, thanks very much. That's a really clear messaging in that, Seamus. Uh, you might stop sharing there if that's okay. Yep. And Jonathan, if you're ready to, sh to share. Yeah. Well, I just while Jonathan's getting ready there, a, a question coming in, and I suppose it alludes to, I suppose, one of the key questions around dairy herd size. The farmers you're dealing with, and I know most of them will have expanded over the last number of years, but where is there, where in general, is it easy to, or is it possible to say where their heads are around animal numbers moving forward? Are they uh, leveling out or are they, some of them still uh, intending to increase herd size? Yeah, uh, very good question, Pat. In general, I know from my own experience, um, I was dealing with 150 farmers in, um, in the south of the country and the big expansion was finished, Pat. It's about tidying up the herds, breeding better stock. It's about uh, better rather than bigger is, 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 I think, the big message going forward. Okay. Jonathan, uh, we're seeing your slideshow presentation. If you want to go into display settings, you might... Uh, I'm not seeing it as an actual presentation, no? Not yet. Just try it again there. And if you up at the top of your screen, you'll see display settings. I think there's an option under there to. Um, yeah. And if you click on that and swap to presenter view, yeah. Perfect, yeah. perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay. Work away. Yeah. So, as I was saying, my, uh, my name is Jonathan. I work in Chagastown in um, Moor Park in, in, in Cork. And uh, today I'm just going, I'm, first of all, I'm going to change tact um, a little bit from what Seamus was talking about, a bit of background into what is, you know, carbon footprint, what, how are greenhouse gas emissions calculated, um, and then give some example farms. So first of all, I'm going to talk about life cycle assessment model, uh, give a bit of context to it, and then the case studies, yeah. So just to begin then, so life cycle assessment. So life cycle assessment, it's an internationally standardized methodology. Um, and what it does essentially, it calculates the environmental burden of a product, process, or service from the point of raw extraction up to the point in which you know it, it's uh, disposed of. Um, and this is different from the national inventory. The way the national inventory works, it's what happens within the country. What life cycle assessment does, it goes a step further. It also accounts what goes into that product uh, to produce uh, to produce it. 
So um, there's, there's, there is a difference between life cycle assessment and the inventory. And this could be seen on the graph to your right. So the inventory uh, emissions would only calculate what's in gray. So what happens on farm, um, but what life cycle assessment does accounts for farm inputs, so your fertilizer, your concentrate, uh, additional forage that will be coming into the system, your electricity, your fuel, as well as, you know, if you're bringing livestock into uh, your, uh, your, your farm also. Um, so for agriculture systems, um, what's commonly done, it's a cradle farm gate uh, analysis. And what that means essentially is it's everything up until the point on, on, until the milk leaves the farm in uh, the lorry or, um, you know, the lambs or the cows go in the trailer or there's wool sold as well, up to the point in, when, in which the product leaves the farm essentially. And within that, then we calculate greenhouse gas emissions, ammonia, nitrates and all that. Uh, to make it, I suppose, I suppose, to communicate the, I suppose, the results of the life cycle assessment, you have to express it for with a common relatable unit. So for lamb and for beef, it would be per kilo carcass weight or per kilo live weight. For milk, it's per kilo fat and protein correct milk. And for both of those, then we express per hectare. And that's important because it acts as almost a proxy for total emissions. So, yeah. So just, um, just to discuss briefly, I suppose, uh, recent work we've done. Uh, so that life cycle assessment I was talking about, that's what we use in Chagas. It's what's used in Borbea to calculate your, your, your farm carbon footprints. Um, and previously, it was heavily reliant, I suppose, on international default values. And, you know, it was functional. It worked. It was the best available science to us at the moment, at, at that moment of time. However, um, the default values, the international default values, they come from numerous studies across the world, not fully representative of our climate or our, our environment, environment uh, in Ireland. And so, you know, um, the department as well as Chagas and all that have invested in, you know, in, in research, uh, try to develop our own methodology to calculate emissions. Um, and that, 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 that research is coming on, coming on stream uh, through the form of scientific publications. Um, as well as that then, this has been happening across the globe. So as more science comes on stream, the methodology, um, you know, the recommended methodology changes. And what you're essentially doing is uh, you're continuously increasing or improving the accuracy of, um, of the life cycle assessment model. So just examples of this, I suppose. So previously, um, there was all fertilizer types were treated the same in terms of emissions. However, we knew that there was difference in, in, fer in emissions from canned urea and protected urea. We just didn't have the evidence to prove it to, uh, I suppose, the likes of the EPA. Um, research has been conducted uh, in Chagas and has been accepted that, you know, there's emi different emissions for canned urea and protected urea. And they, this has been accepted by EPA and it's now in our national inventory and in our life cycle assessment models. Similar then for urine and dung. Um, the nitrogen that's excreted in urine and dung was, was deemed the same in terms of emissions. However, urine is far more susceptible to nitrogen loss than that of dung. Um, once again, we needed evidence to show that, to prove it. That has been conducted and has been accepted in the EPA National Inventory. So they're also in um, the, EPA, the National Inventory and our, our um, life cycle assessment models. Um, on top of that, then, too, you know, Outside of the farm, I suppose the farm gate, you know, the stuff that's coming onto your, your farm, your, let's say, for example, your fertilizer. So the, the factories that are producing fertilizer through the years, they've become more efficient, um, you know, in producing fertilizer. They've also become more conscious about the emissions they're generating, and they have adopted um, um, strategies to try to reduce emissions. And that feeds into life cycle assessment because you use fertilizer uh, to uh, grow grass. So that's another benefit. So what this means essentially, so recent work that we've uh, done uh, between ourselves, uh, ICBF and, um, and Borbea, uh, we've updated uh, Borbea's life cycle assessment model uh, to calculate the current footprint of dairy farms as part of the SDAS program. So in the previous version of the life cycle assessment, the average footprint was 1.1. Um, however, I just, just, just talk about the stuff that I've, the updates I'm after talking to you about. When you implement those, um, as, along with you know, other um, some sort of small changes. What it really do, what happens is that the 1.1 is reduced down to 0 0.99. So this is our new average carbon footprint for a dairy farm in Ireland. It's basically a base change. So the farming system hasn't changed at all. It's just the way it's calculated has changed. And the reason it's reduced is because we're making it more representative of the emissions that are generated from Irish um, farming systems. Okay. So that's where we're starting at. 
Um, so if, if you are a dairy farmer that's listening today, you can go on to your, I'm, I'm sure you got uh, some form of communication that you can go on to 4B online, you can go in, you can check your carbon footprint um, to know where you are, essentially to where, what, to benchmark yourself against, I suppose, your peers as other farmers. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's your starting point and how can we bring that number down, essentially. Um, in terms of the beef side of things, um, the any farmer that's part of the SBLAS uh, can go on, they can check their carbon footprint for the beef they're producing. Um, the Chagas life cycle assessment models have been updated in line with what I've just talked about in terms of the dairy. Um, the Borbia, however, is not at the, at the same stage as, uh, as the dairy model. However, the process is underway and the next couple of months, the, 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 the Borbia beef LCA model will be up to date and will um, be in line with the dairy model now. So just going on then, it's also coming back to what Seamus was talking about, the mitigation strategies. So um, I would talk about the carbon footprint. What essentially the carbon footprint is, is an efficiency measure. When you express anything per kilo output, it's, your, it's, it's an efficiency measure. So the more efficient you are producing that product, the lower your carbon footprint is going to be. Um, how you reduce your carbon footprint uh, impacts your total emissions. So if you're improving, I suppose, the efficiency of your system, there, you know, you, you're potentially, uh, you know, creating scope to increase your productivity. Um, and as a result, you know, although you're reducing your emissions per kilo output, your total emissions uh, could remain static. They could go up slightly or they could reduce slightly. Uh, to counteract this, that's why we need to look at our absolute emissions. We need to know the impact of different um, management practices on both carbon footprint as well as your absolute emissions. And this is very important because ideally, at the end of the day, what we're trying to find our mitigation strategies that can reduce both your footprint, so reduce a, your, your footprint, which is going to help the marketing of the product which you're producing, and your total emissions also. So as, as Pat was talking about and what Seamus was talking about, uh, I'll be going through a couple of uh, example farms. So just talk about Seamus, uh, some of the mitigation strategies that Seamus talked about. I just implemented them onto example signpost farms and what impact they might have on their, uh, their carbon footprint. So this is an example of one dairy farm that's part of the signpost uh, program uh, in 2019. So we say 2019 because it's, um, it's the year before they started the signpost program. So it's where they, what their starting point was before they actually changed anything. So this farmer was 0 0.96. So he's already better than the national average of 0.99. So already good starting point. Um, however, talking to the farmer, there was a couple of areas which he, he wanted to change and he was going to improve on. So the first thing was he was already doing very well with the milk solids, 550 kilo milk solids. Uh, however, he felt he could, he could go that bit further because it's herd, it was a very young herd and he uh, was going to start selecting more for uh, the milk constituents, so your fat and your protein. So he believed he was able to get to the 540 kilo uh, solids between that and an older herd. Uh, fertilizer, um, he was at the max of fertilizer. He was spending 250 kilos of nitrogen, the majority of which was in the form of can. As I said previously, a can releases substantially more uh, emissions than that of the likes of urea and protected urea. And um, therefore, I was trying to move away from the can to go towards protected urea. Protected urea is also going to help the farmer economically. It's, um, you know, it's cheaper per kilo of nitrogen than, uh, than that of can at the moment also. Um, in terms of manure management, then, uh, the adoption, full adoption of low emission slurry spreading, so your trail and shoe and your brand spreading, um, and Seamus has talked about these. This is just implementing these on farm. What it actually what actually happens in terms of your carbon footprint? You're you're basically reducing your reliance on synthetic fertilizer because you're increasing the amount of nitrogen available um, from the manure you spread. Um, turn out day. Try to maximize um, you know your diet uh, on the form of fresh grass and also reducing your reliance on meal. And what this essentially does is that by implementing those um, as well as changes. This farmer was able to reduce their emissions by, by approximately around 16, 17%. So 0 0.96 down to 0 0.8. Second farmer then, uh, once again, um, starting at a really a very strong point at 0 0.9. Um, so, you know, he's nearly 10% 10, 10 lower than that of the national average. So very good starting point. Um, he was quite, the farmer was happy where he was in terms of animal production. He was getting 530 kilo solids. He didn't believe he could go much more without, you know, having, you know, I suppose, a system drift, you know, more meal, uh, more, you know, more intensive system. So he was happy enough with how he was, in, with his milk production. 
Uh, if milk, uh, the fertility, 18% replacement rate, he was relatively happy with that. You could reduce it slightly more, but he was happy with it. So the areas what he really wanted to target was his fertilizer, which was 100% uh, can in 2019, and it was 233 kilos uh, uh, per hectare. So he was trying to reduce it by 20% and go on 100% protected urea. And that's how you achieve that, as Seamus talked about, is, uh, you know, ground up, you start with your soil fertility, uh, get your indexes right, get your pH right, um, then you go and you, you know, put in good grassland management, and then you also better manure management, incorporation of clover, they all contribute to less reliance on synthetic fertilizer. Um, this farm as well, one of the main things was turnout dates, so um, he was part-time turnout date up to 28th of April, try to try to get the cows out full time before that date and also trying to reduce reliance on meal. Impact of this then is that that farmer was, uh, the carbon footprint reduced from 0 0.9 down to 0 0.77. So once again, another a drop of, that's a drop of around uh, 14%. So just a summary of what I just talked about there. So life cycle assessment is the methodology to calculate emissions on farm. Uh, as well as other in indicators, if you wanted to calculate ammonia, uh, nitrate leaching, uh, as well as other in indicators that could be done through life cycle assessment. Uh, the method has been updated uh, as more uh, research has come on stream. Uh, Irish research at that to make sure that um, the numbers that we are um, providing are more accurate uh, to the actual systems we're, which we're, we're, we're measuring. Um, there needs to be continuous focus on efficiency-based measures and the, the solutions need to be adopted quickly to get, to, you know, to be rewarded uh, or to be credited uh, in, in the national inventory. So um, the efficiency-based measures, you know, the reason we focus on these is, yes, it's going to reduce your emissions um, per kilo output and it's going to reduce your total farm emissions, but it's also uh, going to improve the economic performance of the farm also, which is a, a benefit uh, to the farmer. Um, there's also a number of uh, new, I suppose, mitigation strategies being tested out uh, within Chagas as well as other research in institutes. Um, they haven't been on, they're not on stream at the moment, however, they are in the process and they will be available to farmers uh, to further reduce their emissions in, in the future. So um, that's all I have for you. Um, thank you for listening and any questions, more than happy to answer. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So we all could turn back on our screens. Um, I suppose just a, a question for you. you, you looked at some of the, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, issues that, that are being assessed that have uh, shown to have a, a, maybe a lower impact than was originally thought from, from uh, ba uh, basic tier one inventories. Are there any other elements of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are under investigation that have some possibilities in the same light and are there some that maybe are going to lead to higher levels of emissions being shown? Yeah, uh, there's actually, it's, it's very active at the moment within Chagas, so um, I suppose to start with there's, you know, there's a lot of work going on with methane at the moment, so at the moment we're using international methodology to calculate methane, um, you know, we want, we want to make that more representative of the grass-based diet that we have, which isn't what is commonly, uh, common around the world, which the numbers which we're using are based on. Um, so, yeah, there's research being conducted in, Ch in Chagas Moor Park using the green feed uh, machines. I think my colleague Ben Lahart was actually on this uh, webinar a couple, of, um, a couple of months ago discussing them. And what that essentially is, is we're trying to derive our own methodology to calculate methane. Um, and what we're, what we're preliminary results are fine is that we are slightly overestimating methane um, with our current methodology, particularly in the springtime. We're going to, what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a seasonal effect on methane. Other areas, yeah. other areas we're looking at uh, manure management, new emission factors, Irish emission factors for manure management, for lime application, um, and there's also work in carbon sequestration also. Okay. Parik, I'll hand over to you. Sometimes uh, typos can give us interesting questions because we have a, a question. I don't know which of the lads are going to answer it in relation to the National Fairy Herd. <laughs> Parik, you might. Maybe there's a silver bullet in there somewhere or a fairy dust that'll solve a lot of the problems. That, um, I guess one of the main ones that's coming up is around the 1% reduction, Seamus, that you mentioned as regards 1% per, per week um, in the increase in the, the grazing period. Where uh, one of the main questions is what um, period is your, your current calculation on or um, where are you moving forward? Jonathan, you mentioned movement to being 
having everything out before the end of April. And um, so, what's the basis there? Yeah, well, I, I suppose now important uh, from the, the the research done. Some farms might have a six month grazing season. They might extend it one more week. Other farms could have an eight month grazing season that extended another week. The extending the week is where you're um, grazing better quality grass uh, versus higher fiber silage, and you're also creating less slurry in the shade that has to be respread again by a slurry tanker. So regardless of your 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 current time frame, if you can get another week onto it, it will feed through in the figures at about one percent reduction extra week of grass now some farmers will probably push as far as they can go and stocking rate will be the biggest determinant on that one okay jonathan there was a, a number of questions there as well for you just around a lot of what you're looking at are mitigation strategies um, and that seems to be where a lot of the research is based just on carbon sequestration when are we going to see similar figures and see those incorporated in models that you're working with yeah, so there's, I'm sure it's been talked about here before, uh, the carbon observatory that's been rolled out within Ireland. Are, um, you know, they're going around different sites and they're looking at different, the effect of different management practices and how that affects uh, carbon sequestration because we don't have the data available to us. We know that the ground is sequestering carbon. Uh, it's We need to validate that. We need to have solid numbers on that to implement them into life cycle assessment and methodology and, and from there implement it into national mm -hmm. inventory. So... It's a long-term project. Uh, carbon sequestration is a long-term process, um, but eventually, in the next couple of years, we should have good data available to us to show us that effect of you know grazing, the effect of uh, silage harvesting, the effect of receding, and then also uh, peatland as well. How that affects carbon sequestration, and once we have that, then we can come up with a methodology that can be certified. That then we can implement into it. But it's it's only it's only starting at the moment, and it's going to take a couple of years. It's a slow process. You're, you're on a roll, Jonathan, while you're on a roll. LCA for greenhouse gas emissions for hill farms um, and also for, say, beef finishing systems, stored beef finishing systems. Um, when will we see them on, come on stream? Yeah, so what we, what we plan on doing actually is, um, so at the moment, the only way to calculate your carbon footprint is if you're signed up for Borbia. You could, could use an, an external tool from the likes of the UK or France and all that. But August, what we're trying, to, what we're planning on doing is to develop a tool um, that covers dairy, sheep, uh, beef, and tillage, um, that a farmer can go into, an advisor can go into. You can put in your numbers, and from there you can you can calculate your carbon footprint. Now that's once again, it's, it's it's we've we've started the process, um, but that's what essentially what we do because there is a demand there. People want to go, to know where they're starting, um, yeah. Okay, do you use uh, GWP100 or GWP star and um, which and yeah. why? We back to you then, James. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, so GWP star, um, I'm, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's very topical at the moment. It's, 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 it's treating methane as if it's a circular gas, which it is. GWP star, far more correct than GWP100. Um, the problem is trying to implement that at a farm level is difficult. You know, you can implement GWP star at a national level because we have data for it. Um, to calculate GWP start, you need 20 years data because it's all retrospective to where you were 20 years ago. At a farm level, do we have good enough data to know what pro, uh, production system you had 20 years ago? It's, it's, it's difficult to implement at farm level. So at the moment, it's GWP 100. I 100% agree with GWP star and should be implemented at a national level. Implemented at a farm level, it's, it's difficult. Seamus, um, have there been any developments or anything, uh, any research that you're aware of just around ammonia emissions uh, from open tanks and maybe having shelter beds upwind from them? Um, I guess a, a number of questions coming in on agroforestry and just the use of um, shelter beds for this question in particular on, on reducing ammonia emissions, but also around um, increasing the, the grazing period and agroforestry. So two questions kind of tree related. Well, the figures I put up there, Porik, is, is just looking at extending the grazing season by a week. The knock-on effect it has on the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I know you've had presentations before where the shelter beds can extend the grazing season with certain types of stock. So the longer you can extend the grazing season, the more positive benefit it would have on it. Um, in relation to the open tanks, um, I suppose the emissions from the open tanks, where it's coming from, is the ammonia being released. Um, it's a, a part of the ammonia MAC. It's a small component of it, but it will have a big effect for individual farmers. Uh, that they would have to cover them, I think, by 2027, if I'm correct in that one, Pat, there, on yep. the year that they have to be covered by. And I think there's potentially some uh, uh, likelihood of 
of support for, for tree, tree planting and shelter belts around uh, uh, in the next cap. So we're hopeful that something will come out there. Okay, uh, Seamus, this one's definitely for you. Um, look, lots of compliments on the, the clarity of the presentation and the clarity of the measures that are there. How do you propose on getting this information out to advisors and from advisors onto farmers on the ground, Seamus? Obviously, a lot of work to be done in that. There's... Yeah, and I suppose what, what, my, my role, Park, is a training development specialist to help train the, our own advisors in Chagas. Uh, we're working with the ACA as well. We're also working our industry partners to try and uh, get the shift from like say can affect the urea, incorporating more clover into the swords, reducing the protein in the meal, uh, trying to improve soil fertility. So we, we, we're, we're kind of hitting the, the ground running at the minute. Uh, the one thing I would say is there's almost 400 people on the call today, Park. So what I would like to ask everyone on the call, if you can tell five other people practical implications that they can undertake on their farm and get them to tell another two or three people each, we, can, we all have a role to spread positive message. Because um, the one thing is, I think actually farming is going to surprise the country that it will meet its emission targets, especially for the first five years. Um, I think what we're being asked to do, if, if everyone puts their shoulder to the wheel, it's very doable. Uh, I think a lot more doable than 300,000 electric cars by 2025 um, from the, the transport sector. Um, mm -hmm. But that is the role we have, Porik, and I know this uh, Siobhan Cabinet's communication specialist is also helping try to get the message out there through the, the media um, in contact with our manager, Tom O'Dwyer. Seamus giving people homework on a Friday evening. That's not on. Absolutely. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Be ambitious. Jonathan, back to you on the global warming potential. Um, a few questions in on uh, why you need 20 years data. If you could just elaborate on that a little. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. So with the GWP star, you're treating methane as a circular gas. So it's, you know, if, if the natural herd remain the same, it's the same carbon being circled. Uh, they're going, carbon goes in to grow grass, cow eats the grass, turns to methane. And then that goes back down and the form of CO2 back to grow grass. So it's, and the cycle is uh, said to be a 20 year cycle. Um, so essentially, why we need that is that, let's say today is, uh, you know, we're in 20, 2021. If in 2001 uh, we have the same number of animals uh, than we have today, it's essentially the exact same carbon uh, being circled around. So there's no uh, additional warming caused by those animals being on, uh, um, present on the farm. Um, it's it's just because it's the, it's the life, this life cycle of of methane. That's the reason why you need twenty years data. We need to know has the herd changed within that time period. Okay, good stuff. Lots of praise coming in for the two presentations, guys. And here's one we'll throw at both. The I guess zero grazing has become a more common. And I one, have you got it included in any of your LCAs? And two, um, is it helping to kind of increase the, the sequestration because you can. Uh, get access to the grass all year round, similar to extending the grazing, or for a longer period, not necessarily all year round, but similar to extending the grazing, like what you had with the chance. Yeah, like um, zero grazed grass can be implemented in LCA very easy. You just change the diet from silage, from grass silage to fresh grass, because that's, that's that's what it is. Uh, in terms of carbon sequestration, there's research going on. The, there is research on the way on the effect of cutting grass, how that affects uh, carbon sequestration. I can't say here now today what it's actually what exactly it is, but um, it is going to come on stream in the next couple of years. What impact it does have? I suppose there's a comment on that one, Paul. Look, I suppose the, the big thing with the with, with zero grazing, it's important that the overall stocking rate, like a stocking rate of two point four cows per hectare, you need to be grown over fourteen ton of grass across the whole farm. So that's the, the fundamental first of all. Don't overstock the whole farm. But as well as that, look, once you start going over three and a half cows per hectare on a milking block, it's getting fairly intensive then at that stage. So it's because, and the cows end up being inside a lot more of the year. So if the overall stocking rate no more than 2.4, and probably the milking platform, even with the zero grass brought back in, being around maybe the three to three and a half mark, not to over push things. And is there a concern in relation to that, that you have a lot more slurry and slurry uh, tends to, be, to have more both ammonia emissions and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions than uh, deposited urine and, and uh, feces on the, uh, directly onto pasture. Yeah, absolutely, Pat, because you, you are kind of increasing the indoor period, which is create more greenhouse gases. But as well as that, like when we're on about the, 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 um, the sustainability, it's, it's important that the farmer's sustainable too, and zero grazing does create more work for the farmer. So we also have to be very cognizant of the farmer that we don't push the farmer too hard. Question there. Sorry, go ahead, 
Yeah, there, uh, a, a question there. Is there any studies on carbon sequestration values of hedges in, in, in uh, particularly uh, hedges of different compositions? Yeah, no, the, um, uh, uh, Jagos down in um, uh, Johnson Castle are doing a good lot of work down there uh, in yeah. terms of carbon sequestration on hedgerows. Um, and it, it's actually really good what they're doing. They're using satellite imagery to calculate the lighter technology. They're uh, calculating the density of hedgerows or maybe scrub areas. And from that, they're able to determine how much carbon is there and how does that change over time. Once again, it's not at the stage where it can be implemented, like the actual validated methodology to implement that at LCA basis and national imagery basis is not fully there yet. But the research in terms of hedgerows is it's well underway. Yeah. But it was, so it was it was something. Sorry, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, the big one is sequestration is look, I suppose if they discover that we are sequestrating. Um, a certain amount, um, we we'll just say we're starting with 23 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Just say for argument's sake, it's a million tonnes. We're, we're then starting at 22 million tonnes. It's not like the million tonnes we've discovered of our sequestering comes off what we have to reduce. Okay, So the sequestration is, the sequestration will help the farmers, but it's not the silver bullet to help us reduce the emissions. We still have to work to get this, the lime, the soil fertility, switch fertiliser use, and in the part of the Climate Action Bill, a plan for 2021, it's, it's, it's predicated on 65% of all can being spread as predicted urea by 2030, that we spread 90% of our low, of our slurry by low emission slurry spreading, and that farmers in general reduce their fertilizer by 20% by 2030. They're three of the big things that are in the carbon action plan for 2021, and a lot of our figures are being based upon. Okay. Yeah. So sequestration will help us long term, but as an industry, we need to make the move and start creating actions at a huge level throughout the whole country to move the dial and to show that agriculture is going to reduce its overall emissions, help improve profitability for farmers. There's a question there about the fertilizer prices in, in, in the next uh, in, in the coming year and how farmers are going to, to cope with, with the the issue of, of nearly a trebling in, in, in nitrogen prices in, in particular and, and what was opportunity that gives you to try and get messages out there in terms of how to, to be more efficient. What are going to be your key messages to you? To, yeah. to well, well, I suppose the, the key message, first of all, Pat, is to, to, to mine the slurry. And the slurry, rather than going out just because you can on the 12th of January in some cases, maybe to hold off until February and to use the slurry to replace the first round. And I really seen it in my own area last year. The first round fertilizer was very much replaced by uh, slurry uh, in the form of um, the low emission slurry spreading. And two and a half thousand gallons of slurry with a low emission slurry spreader in February, March period can replace 23 units of nitrogen. That's your first round. So that's the, the important thing, first of all, is mining the slurry. It's, it's like liquid gold. That's what we need to start treating it like at this stage. The next thing then is um, protected urea at the minute is about 20%, even though prices have gone ridiculous at this stage, it's still 20% cheaper than can equivalent on a unit of nitrogen basis. So definitely make the switch. And you can't expect the supplier to have the protected urea in the air the day you go in to buy it. So the task I would say to anyone on this morning is get their farmers to start looking for protected urea now because the industry will get it. The demand is there. The demand is there. They won't have it in when you need it and it doesn't store long-term over the winter period. Uh, and then it's, 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 been, it's tailoring um, the amount of fertilizer. So it's, it's reducing a little bit throughout the whole year. And I know when the questions come in there, 25% reduction is too much to ask a dairy farmer. It is, absolutely. But we're talking about getting the soil fertility right and over time, getting the lime right, first of all, for those have the soil fertility right, start incorporating clover, mixed species swords, that that would help reduce fertilizer over time. A 10% reduction in fertilizer at a dairy farm can reduce emissions by 2%. 10% is very doable. We did it in 90. Yeah. There's two, two, sorry, Jonathan, you want to add to that? No, like just of my stuff that, that the work I'll be doing with life cycle assessment, the biggest reduction that, that can be achieved is just a straight switch from fertilizer types. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, but, it's, and to put perspective, Porik, a switch from 100% can to 100% protected urea is the same as cutting your fertilizer by 40%. Yeah. Huge, huge yeah. gains. There's yeah. another related question there, in, 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 and it's asking about the, the issue of blending of, of uh, a protected urea with phosphate. And I think that's a, 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 that is a no go area. Uh, but I think there's there's work being done on the the emissions from some of the high PK compounds, Jonathan. I think yeah, you're familiar with it, and the fact that some of those are actually lower emitting than than your can as well. Exactly. Yeah. 
there's, they're, they're doing research. You, yeah, sorry, Pat, you did ask me that earlier on. They're, they're, they are doing work. So the, the work we've done so far in fertilizer, it's for CAN, 27% nitrogen, protected urea, and just normal urea. What they're doing now is looking at the emissions from compounds, uh, you know, the likes of your 10, 10, 20, 18, 6, 12, and even your P and your, your PNK um, uh, uh, fertilizers as well. And yeah, when we get them on stream, uh, we should see another reduction. Uh, yeah, and I think the initial, the initial findings are that, that the uh, losses from, from those compounds are less than yeah. from them. Yeah, so it's, they can become part of the solution. Yeah, there's a nice few questions there, Pat, just around, um, I suppose, the sentiment. There's two, two trains of thought. One is that uh, dairy and beef consumption will increase. The demand will be there for these luxury proteins for decades to come as it will continue to increase. Um, why would we let other countries uh, produce it at a less efficient uh, production level than ourselves? And the other train of thought is reduce the herd, reduce the problem, or reduce the herd and pay farmers more for their product. Um, just well, to I'd, comment on that, please. Yeah, I'll just come in there on that one. Look, I suppose, but in the context from a dairy point of view, uh, our footprint is about uh, roughly a kilo of carbon dioxide per kilo of milk produced. Uh, internationally, it's closer to 2.9. So we're about a third, almost about a third of the, the international figure. Uh, B for one of the lowest carbon footprints again within the EU, um, and I suppose when 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 um, people talk about replacing what you eat in your diet, they use international figure. So rather than saying you shouldn't be eating meat or milk, what they should be saying is you should eat Irish meat and milk. That's what they should be saying first of all. We have a lay, low, way lower footprint. I suppose the big issue is we're part of the EU. The EU is about ten percent of international emissions overall. Um, EU wants to be best in class. They've set a target of 55% reduction by 2030. As part of that, the Irish government has set a reduction of 51% for the economy and agriculture has been built into that at 22 to 30%. That is the bigger picture. We cannot change that policy. Um, the sentiment, I wouldn't disagree with it, but I suppose we have to work within the framework product that we have to work with it. Yeah. Jonathan, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, they're referring to carbon leakage and it, it does happen. You know, if we don't produce it and the demand is going to go up, somebody less efficient is going to fill that gap and total global emissions will probably go up. However, as Shane has talked about, we are tied to reduction in national emissions and we have to be seen to um, to achieve those, you know. And, you know, there's a possibility we can maintain our production, uh, increase production, but we have to do so in a more carbon efficient manner. Um, that's That's what we need to do. Okay. I guess I, sorry, yeah. Go ahead, no. We're quite... No, no, I think we're, we're, we're nearly hitting our, our, our time. So I'd like to thank the two speakers for absolute clarity in, in, in the messaging. I think it was really clear. And uh, Jonathan, I think your update on, on kind of the, the research that's coming through in terms of the, the level uh, and, and the representing of the research that's been carried out by a lot of your colleagues was really clear and, and, and really welcome. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, next week, we'll be back and we're joined by colleagues from, from Athby in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, Donica Doody and, and Russell Adams, looking at uh, some of the initiatives that they're looking at to uh, manage the risk of, of pea loss from slurry in Northern Ireland, where it is a major part of their in, environmental problem, slightly bigger than ours, but we have a, a lot of it as, as well. So I think it will be a, a really interesting presentation from, from uh, the two researchers with Athby. So thank you very much again for, for joining us this morning. Thanks to our, our presenters. Uh, thanks to, to uh, uh, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher, uh, our production team. Uh, and until next week, we hope to see you again. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
Thanks, Pat. Okay. Talk to you. Bye-bye.